So welcome, this is a video for section 10.3, which is all about confidence intervals for proportions. And I want to just put this in before we again put in a little bit of kind of context of the entire um, chapter. We're talking about inference really in chapter 10 and all throughout the remainder of the year pretty much. Um, inference is kind of split into two large categories, confidence intervals that we've been starting um, in chapter 10, and later on in chapters 11 and 12 we're going to get into something called hypothesis tests. And there'll be some branches here when we talk about different kinds of hypothesis tests. But right now we're talking about different kinds of confidence intervals. And in section 10.2, we talked about confidence intervals for means, right? That's where we did the t, t interval. Well, now we're doing the exact same problem, confidence intervals, but as they relate to proportion. So it's going to kind of feel a little bit like in chapter 9, when first you had to decide whether it was a mean or a proportion problem, a mean or a proportion problem, and there will be slightly different formulas for whether you were doing a confidence interval for a mean or a confidence interval for a proportion, although it's going to seem very, very similar. Um, eventually, we're going to have similar branches kind of coming over here, and we're going to have, going to have branches, there's going to be different kinds of means and proportions problems, but wait till, free, pre, uh, wait till future chapters for that. So just a little bit of review here. Remember that we're talking about confidence intervals, and our, here's our general formula for all confidence intervals. Statistic plus or minus critical value times the standard error. Statistic plus or minus critical value then times standard error. In section 10.2, when we are talking about means, these were kind of, we derived this formula down at the bottom. Remember, these were the formulas in chapter 9, and we ended up with a formula x bar plus or minus t star s over the square root of n. Well, now we're talking about proportions, and so remember these were our formulas, and we were talking about sampling distribution problems for proportions in chapter 9. So just kind of by extension, the statistic, used, the statistic when you're talking about means, was x bar. Well, now it's going to be p hat, which is a sample proportion. Turns out, we'll talk about this later, but the critical value is some number of standard deviations we're going to use z star again. We don't, need, we don't need to use t for proportions, which we'll talk about in a second. The standard deviation of the sampling distribution of x bar, we ended up using s over n down, s over the square root of n. Well, now we just replace this with this formula, so now we get this um, square root of p hat q hat over n. Just note that actually here it's where you know sigma or you know p or q. Well, we're doing a confidence interval, so these are parameters sigma, p, and q are all parameters. We wouldn't know those when you're doing a confidence interval, so we replace the parameter with the statistic version of that, right? This is the standard deviation of the population. This is the standard deviation of the sample. Same thing goes on over here. We don't know p, so we replace it with p hat. We don't know q, replace it with q hat. Okay. Let's do an example now using this formula. So I fit a lot of information on this slide. This is a complete worked out example. This is a, almost a, every single example in section 10.3 will follow this. So we've got a simple random sample. You took a simple random sample. There's some election going on where there's measure A on the ballot. And it turns out you took a sample and 272 out of the 400 people you asked said, yes, I support measure A. The question is give a 90% confidence interval for the unknown population proportion of those who support measure A. Again, this is totally inference, right? Because what do we care about? We care about P, which is the population proportion of those who support measure A. We don't know that. We don't know what it is for the entire population. We only know what it is for our sample, okay? So it's, again, a good example of inference. These colorful things down here are running through the entire inference toolbox. It works exactly the same way as it did for uh, section 10.2 when we were talking about means which has some slight variations in a new formula. So first we talked about the unknown parameter that used to be mu when we were talking about means. Now it's p when we're talking about proportions, population proportion, population proportion of those who support this thing. And again, like many parameters, it's unknown because we don't know what it is for the entire population. Second thing is we run through our uh, conditions. We know it's a simple random sample. It says so in the question. Do we know the sampling distribution of p hat is normal? We do exactly what we did in section uh, in chapter 9. We check n p hat and q hat is greater than or equal to 10, and it turns out, of course, they are. Now, just one little minor thing. Notice I wrote n p hat here, whereas in chapter 9 we wrote n p. Well, why can't I just write p here? Because, hey, we don't know p, right? p is unknown. 
So very often, it kind of a running theme through this section is when you don't know what p is, which is the unknown parameter, replace it with the uh, statistic version. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. If you wrote np here, you'd say, well, what the heck is p? I have no idea what that is. In fact, that's what the question's asking you. So just replace it with p hat, which is 272 over 40, which you actually do know. And then independence, we'll assume there's at least 10 times 400 voters. Again, that's exactly what we did uh, in Chapter 9. Okay, now we get to the uh, uh, calculations. P hat, we know, is 272 out of 400. That's about 0.68. Here's the formula we sort of derived on the previous page. P hat plus or minus Z star square root of P hat Q hat over N. We actually know all of these things, right? This is P hat. Q hat is just 32%. N is 400, and I got this number Z star just from doing inverse norm of 0.95. And again, it's 0.95 because if you want a 90% interval, there's 5% on each tail. So from the left, it's 95%. And so inverse norm of 0.95 ends up with uh, Z star. Okay, just crank this all out, you get this number. And then I am 90% confident that the... Pro proportion who support measure A in the population is between this and this. Okay, Very, very typical problem. Um, the previous example, I actually, when I said out here I got these numbers, I actually didn't work out that math by hand. It turns out you can do this all in the calculator, which is pretty much going to be a running theme throughout the rest of the year. You go to the stat menu and then go to tests. Again, there's many different uh, per, uh, inference procedures there, intervals and hypothesis tests. Again, a little preview of what's to come. I went to a choice A, which is a one prop Z int, which is sort of the name of this uh, procedure, the name of this thing. We're doing a Z interval for one proportion. It asks me X and N. I just typed in 272 out of 400. Confidence level, which it said in the problem, was 90%. Press the calculate button, and look, it gave me these two answers. That's exactly how I got those answers. And, that's, and then I had to write down this formula as if I actually was showing knowledge of the formula and then the only thing it doesn't really give you over here is the z star value, which you can calculate using inverse norm. Just a general rule of thumb, kind of people get confused a little bit at the beginning. Um, is it a z or is it a t? How do I possibly decide? Pretty much the rule is going to be we use t whenever we're talking about means of any kind and z whenever we're talking about proportions of any kind. I know I kind of cheated you a little bit, and in section 10.1, when we are first learning... Uh, confidence intervals for means. We did a Z interval. That was really just kind of an intellectual academic exercise. We're never going to do that again. So this rule of T for means and Z for proportions uh, is a rule that we're going to basically use throughout the remainder of the year. Don't get confused even though we kind of just started at the beginning and we didn't know confidence intervals using Z for means. We'll never do that again. I just wanted to run through the inference toolbox with you as it relates to this new one prop Z int or a uh, confidence interval for one unknown uh, population proportion. Okay, the first same four steps as it's going to be uh, last section, it'll be through the remainder of the year. First, we list the unknown parameter, that's P, not P hat, which is what I wrote incidentally and crossed it out, but P, which is the unknown population proportion. Check our conditions, same three conditions we're always going to check. Is it a simple random sample? Usually it says so in the question. Normal, now we do NP hat is greater than 10, and Q hat is greater than 10, and is it independent? Population is at least 10 times the sample size. Then step three, we do our calculations. Here's the formula we're going to use. And again, I hopefully you can see where it comes from. It's very much like the other formula, statistic, plus or minus critical value times standard error. And then we interpret with a sentence, I am 95% confident, or whatever confident says in the question. I wrote 95% here, but it could be anything. I am whatever percent confident that the population proportions between blank and blank, and that would be the two numbers you got from doing the calculations. And probably you'd get these numbers from doing uh, using your calculator and not actually doing the math by hand. There's one additional kind of problem that comes up in the section 10.3. We have saw a similar one in section 10.2. Um, which is a problem involving solving for the sample size. So typical problem, you think that about 30% of people support measure B. Okay, the other example is about measure A. This is a, there's lots of measures on the ballot. This is measure B. And you want to take a 95% confidence interval, and you want it to be within plus or minus 2%. Well, the question is how many people should be in your sample. In other words, what should N be? Okay, well, look here. This is the formula for a confidence interval. 
The thing I've circled in yellow is the margin of error, the complete margin of error, and that's what you want to be 2%. So we want this margin of error to be 2%. So I just wrote down 2% equals this margin of error. Z star I got from doing inverse norm. We thought that P was about 30%, so that's what I'm going to put here. P is 0.3, and therefore, obviously, if P is 0.3, Q would be 0.7. You get this equation. Hey, look, the only unknown variable is N. And then you just crank out some algebra, and you get N is about this number. Be very, very careful. Even though I put 1.96 here, when I did this on my calculator, I used um, the features of my calculator, storing things in variables or answer or the exact values. I never rounded because these numbers are so small, rounding 1.96 would get you a different answer here. Make sure here you put the exact whole thing where we say inverse norm of 0.975. Okay, that's what I got. That's what I did there. Don't uh, don't uh, round. Then you get about 216 point something. Now you always for these things when you always want to, these problems solving for the sample size, you always want to round up no matter what you get as the decimal, because you can't have 216.76 people, so we round up and our answer is 217 people. And that's kind of a solving for a sample size example. I want to do one more solving for the sample size example because a weird thing can sort of happen. So now we have, you want to take, oh gee, wrong thing, you want to take a 95% confidence interval for supportive measure C, another measure on the ballot, and you want to be accurate within plus or minus 3%. Well, I do the exact same thing, but notice the number it's missing is, what do I put for p hat and q hat, or p and q? Nowhere in this question did it say what we think p is. Well, it turns out, if you have a value that you think p is, use that one. In this particular case, we didn't, so what I wrote is 0.5. And it turned out that's the most conservative estimate for the margin of error that will make it as big as possible. You can think about it, 0.5 times 0.5 ends up being 0.25, any other converse combination of P's and Q's would be a little bit less than 0.25. So if you don't know, just use 0.5. That'll get you the biggest possible, uh, it's the most conservative way to go. Here you crank out the math again. This time I got 1067.07. And again, hey, look, we always round up, even though it's pretty darn close to 1067, we round up to the next nearest person, and we get 1068. This little 0.5 business here leads to kind of a rule of thumb if we're working with proportions. If you don't know what a value for P, the parameter, use P hat. If you don't know if you have a value for P hat, use 0.5. This is kind of a guideline that will kind of, if you're not sure whether it should be P or P hat um, or 0.5, will kind of get you through a lot of the problems in this section. And I'll say this quite a bit in class. And I think that's really the last thing that sort of wraps up... Uh, Section 10.3.